It's an exciting day for us as it's Transfiguration Sunday. And so to have communion on that Sunday and to combine these, we have a baptism, I think, scheduled in a couple of weeks, don't we? So it'll be the first baptism this month for that youth. So thank you for those words and, and for the faith that you show in your words and your work, Jess. Second Timothy, that's an interesting passage. Normally we go to Matthew 17 or Mark 9 or even Luke 9 to focus on the transfiguration. So that's the theme of today. This is Transfiguration Sunday. It's always the Sunday right before we begin the season of Lent. And so that's our focus. We're on the mountaintop with Jesus. And Peter was an eyewitness. But he's writing later He's not writing at the moment. He's writing in this epistle about the event that took place. And so that's how we need to hear it and how I'd like to read it starting in verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for Peter, his proclamation of faith. And we give thanks for the occasion of your glory being shown on the transfiguration. Do so again, we pray to each of us that the shining light of Jesus Christ might shine away every darkness in our lives and in this world. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So if you were here last week, you remember that we emphasized last Sunday's big event, the closing ceremonies of the Olympics. And we talked about uh, being faster and higher and stronger, and we talked about the motto, and we talked about the five rings. And did you see the closing? Did you notice how the Russians actually do have a sense of humor? <laughs> I thought that was so impressive that they could deprecate themselves through humor when they had the little snowflake be caught and then all of a sudden they burst to that fifth ring. That was great. So tonight, we're going to go again on something that's happening this evening. Tonight is going to be a very special night for some people. The biggest night in Hollywood. What is it? The Academy Awards. One of the most watched events in our nation. 40 million people will tune in to the Academy Awards to watch some of the world's wealthiest people, the most attractive men and women, and some of the finest directors give themselves awards. <laughs> Which means some pretty bizarre acceptance speeches, doesn't it? I've often wondered, why are the Oscars so enamoring to us? Is it because of the red carpet glamour and we kind of uh, play the what if game, what if that was us in that position? How about the outlandish and ostentatious outfits 
that some people wear, and, and we like to see what they're wearing, though some don't wear much. <laughs> and then we're wondering how funny this year's host will be. We know Ellen DeGeneres will do a great job, but will she be another Bob Hope or another Billy Crystal? We'll have to find out. And of course, the hype suspense of the unexpected winners and the unpredictable acceptance speeches. You see, to receive an Oscar in many ways is a cultural anointing. To win is to be instantly inducted into the who's who of Hollywood's elite. An honor that has escaped some of the world's most recognized talents. Alfred Hitchcock, George Lucas, Tom Cruise. But when an obscure actor surprisingly wins an Oscar, his or her life is instantly changed. The public allows them to bask in the full glow of Hollywood, at least for a while. There's no telling who will win or what they'll say, but one thing is for sure. The limelight is limited. The no guarantee that it will last. And they must cherish that moment in the bright lights. Because even anointing into the coolest club of Hollywood is no guarantee of perpetual relevance or enduring respect. As we all know, Tinseltown is littered with cautionary tales of one-hit wonders who hoisted their golden statue and gave their unrehearsed speech only to have their bright lights fizzle out and their popularity trickle away. Now why am I even mentioning the Academy Awards? Especially since I have not seen even one of the nine movies up for Best Picture. <laughs> it's because today is Transfiguration Sunday. When Jesus went to the top of the mountain with his closest friends. Shown in bright lights of dazzling glory, supported by a stellar cast of two of the people's favorites, and was presented his award by no less than the divine director of the world's greatest story. If anyone deserves an Academy Award, it's Jesus. He's the greatest recipient in all history. In our text this morning, Peter is writing to Christians who had their doubts about whether this resurrected Jesus, this one upon whom they had pinned all their hopes, was truly special. Or if his moment in the limelight was over and his popularity was waning away. As time passed from Christ's resurrection and ascension, as persecution intensified, and as the young church became dispersed and disconnected, it's understandable that some began to, to wonder if Jesus really was the biggest star that had ever shown. It had been some time since Jesus was there with, with large gatherings following His popularity just, just to see Him and to hear Him. Now they are having questions. How much of the stories they shared about his deity and his power was truly fact? And how much was legend? How much of their reliance upon his imminent return was inflated? Could they really trust what he had said to them? Or, or to stretch the Academy Awards analogy. Was he really a bargain bin Oscar winner with a surprising win, but forgettable words and fading impact? Or was he a, a Tom Hanks or a, a Meryl Streep, you know, the real enduring, bright, shining deal? Well, Peter is pointing out in this text 
to the others that it was at the transfiguration that Jesus first fully took the stage. At the top of that high mountain with Peter right there along with James and John, they witnessed the bright lights of heaven shining down on Jesus. Moses and Elijah making a cameo appearance with full support. And the very voice of God saying as clear as a, a movie theater surround sound, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Now there are at least two things for Peter that set apart this moment from any of the other so-called divine, experience, divine experiences of the wannabe messiahs. First, think about who presented it. Jesus didn't make this declaration to himself. He didn't vote himself into a, an award. Nor was it bestowed upon him by some Hollywood starlet who struggled to pronounce his name correctly or to speak into the microphone. No, this recognition was given by the divine director himself, Almighty God, the greatest of all stardom, publicly declaring this man to be the brightest and biggest of stars. And then secondly, Peter says, consider the script support that brought Christ to this platform. Standing on the mountain with him are who? Moses and Elijah. Two men whose lives and words sat at the heart of the Hebrew Scriptures. The presence was like having the two greatest, best supporting actors up there with you. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing all prophets. Their presence at this time was to proclaim Christ's divinity and the fulfillment of all the amassed awards into one person who turns out was co-writer, executive producer, and leading actor of the greatest story ever told. For Peter, the implications are clear. If the transfiguration really took place, which Peter was an eyewitness to and staking his life on, then despite the persecution, despite the false teachers, despite a kingdom that's seen in part but still longed for in full, this Christ is the real deal worth joining the cast of countless supporters. He cannot fail us. After all, when someone rises from the dead, you believe what he tells you. You trust him. And when the most respected religious figures in history, Moses and Elijah, come back from the dead to say the very same thing, well, you really, really can trust Jesus and what he has to say. But Peter doesn't stop there with those two points. He goes even further. In this text, he refers to this truth of Christ, this prophetic word is what he says, as more than a revelation in just the past, but a word that we can trust today. Did you notice in the text that Peter speaks of this in the present tense as an active reality in our lives? A lamp currently actively shining in a dark place, he says. Think of it like this. It's as if the moment that Jesus stepped onto that stage to receive his rightful due as the beloved Son of God, he began his acceptance speech. But he's never stopped. His message is still going on, still being shared, still being listened to by listeners. 
His truth is still tweeting and Facebooking and shared on every media known to humankind. Jesus is still speaking. Not just a single speech or some super sermon, but his words are still echoing, they're still reaching, they're still revelant, not just to 40 million people in one night, but by billions of people for 2,000 years. Peter's audience was afraid that their Savior's time in the spotlight had faded. That the reason for their troubles was that Jesus had been played off the stage or had faded into irrelevance after his moment in the spotlight. But Peter is assuring them and he's assuring you and me. Jesus' words are still cutting edge to whatever stress or struggle that you are battling. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus has the power to shine brightly in the darkest corner of your life. I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me and follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When the goal of so many is fame and glory and wealth, and you and I are just normal people struggling to get by, we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This table is like an Oscar. It symbolizes the achievement of the one hosting. And when you and I gather before it, just like millions who have tuned in like us, we cast our vote on the one deserving more than anyone else, our trust and loyalty and faithfulness to the person and to the message. A Lifetime Academy Award performance given for you and for me.